Amen. All right, so we're going to study the Bible a little bit this morning. We're going to look at um, this story in the Bible. Now, the interesting thing, you know, this, of course, is a story about some tribes in the Bible when they're about to um, possess um, the promised land. They're about to go into the promised land. An interesting situation happens before they are, you know, to go and possess the land across on the west side of the Jordan. So that God had given the children of Israel um, all the land on the west side of the Jordan. And here you see a, an interesting twist to that story. But the interesting thing, before we even get started, the interesting thing about the Bible is that there's so many different things that we can learn from the stories in the Bible, not only you know, down to the individual people and the things that those people go through, but you can look at the nations, you know, you look at the study of the nation of Israel, um, you know, people and, and the way nations acted, but then you can also, and you know, things that we can learn and apply to our lives today, but then you can actually pull back um, even further than that and look at situations between nations and, and learn something there. And we're going to do that this morning. We're just going to do some Bible study and then I'll show you um, what we're going to apply from this story. But we're just basically going to look at the situation with how these nations settled the land and see what we can take from that and, and learn from that this morning. So in Numbers chapter 32, you see the story about the tribes that decided to settle on the east side of the Jordan River. And of course, this is the, the tribe of Gad, the tribe of Reuben, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. So half of the tribe of Manasseh um, settled on the east, and half of that tribe settled on the west. But you see in Numbers chapter 32, if you look down at verse number 1, let's just look at what the, the reason that these tribes decided to settle on the east side when everybody else went to fight for the land on the west side of the Jordan. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, that the children of Reuben and the children of Gad had a very great multitude of cattle. And when they saw the land of Jazer and the land of Gilead, that behold, the place was for cattle, the children of Gad and the children of Reuben came and spake unto Moses and to Eleazar the priest and unto the princes of the congregation, saying, Ataroth and Dibon and Jazer and Nimrah and Heshbon and Eliah, and Shabim, and Nebo, and Beon, even the country which the Lord smote before the congregation of Israel, is a land for cattle, and thy servants have cattle. So, of course, they've been fighting already. Okay, they've already been fighting to get to the Jordan River, and we see some of those uh, people that they fought there. Wherefore, said they, if we have found grace in thy sight, let this land be given unto thy servants for a possession, and bring us not over the Jordan. And Moses said unto the children of Gad, unto the children of Reuben, Shall your brethren go to war, and shall ye sit here? And wherefore discourage ye the heart of the children of Israel from going over into the land that the Lord hath given them. So, of course, Moses' first comment is, Hey, you know, we're going to fight this huge war to go into the promised land, and you guys are just saying, Hey, we're good right here. He's like, That's not going to be good for everybody else. That's not going to be good for people to think that. You know, why do you think you should get... You know, he's basically saying, are you guys just not wanting to go fight? Are you guys just wanting to just take the easy road and take this land that's here? I mean, that was Moses' first, you know, suspicion. But he says, are we supposed to go fight and just give you this land right here? So it's going to be extra hard for us, and you get the easy way out. But then skip down to verse number 29, and Moses basically tells them, he says, if the children of Gad and the children of Reuben will pass over you pass with you over Jordan, every man armed to battle before the Lord, and the land shall be subdued before you, then ye shall give them the land of Gilead for a possession. But if they will not pass over you with you armed, they shall have possessions among you in the land of Canaan. So this is God basically saying through Moses, saying, hey, if, if they will go fight with you, it's okay that they have this land on the east of the Jordan. If not, they need to just take what was meant for them in the first place and fight with everybody else. And that's the bottom line. There's no easy way out. And then verse 31, we see the answer. And the children of Gad and the children of Reuben answered, saying, As the Lord hath said unto thy servants, so will we do. We will pass over armed before the Lord into the land of Canaan, that the possession of the inheritance on this side of the Jordan may be ours. So, of course, they build, you know, they build cattle fences and all these things, and they leave the women and children. Their plan is they're going to leave the women and children on the east side of the Jordan, and these men will go over with the other tribes of Israel and they will fight through the promised land. And then when that is done, they will go back to the east side of the 
the Jordan and possess their land. So, you know, it was a deal made, basically. It was, they were allowed to do it. They could take that land if they helped fight the battles on the other side. And look, they wanted the land because they had a lot of cattle, they were ranchers, and they saw great pasture land. So they're thinking, hey, this is good for business, and you know, this is just good for us. So that, they're like, this is gonna be our land. Um, they decided that, they got permission, and that was the caveat that they helped fight, all right? Turn to Joshua chapter 22. So now we see there's a situation where you have, you know, these three, these two tribes, or these three tribes, based two and a half tribes, on the east side, and everybody else is on the west side, all right? Now right away, Right away in Joshua 22, we're going to see that trouble begins right away. In Joshua 22, look at verse number 10. The Bible basically says here, as they went over, um, look in, in Joshua 22 and verse number 10. They did something as soon as they got back and they went over to the east side. And the Bible says, and when they came unto the borders of Jordan that are in the land of Canaan, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by Jordan a great altar to see to. So they built this great altar that everybody could see. And the children of Israel heard say, Behold, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh have built an altar over against the land of Canaan in the borders of Jordan at the passage of the children of Israel. So in the place where they all came over the Jordan, these guys got done fighting, they went back home, and they built this big altar on their side. And everybody could see it. All right, And the children of Israel on the west side of the Jordan saw this altar that they built, and they basically were greatly offended that they built another altar, they took, um, they took offense to it, they're like, oh, they, they're going over there, they're starting their own church, basically, they're going to do their own thing over there. So Israel gathers together to go fight. I mean, these guys had just fought together, and they went over there, they built this altar, and Israel, the tribes on the west side, gathers together to go fight the two and a half tribes on the east. But look at verse 26. The children, on, or the, 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 the children of Gad and Reuben and the half-tribe of Manasseh explained their way out of this in verse 26. And they said, Therefore we said, Now let us now prepare to build us an altar, not for burnt offering nor for sacrifice, but it, that, it, that it may be a witness between us and you and our generations after us that we might do the service of the Lord before him with our burnt offerings and with our sacrifices and with our peace offerings, that your children may not say to our children in time to come, we have no part in the Lord. Therefore said we that it shall be then when they shall go, they should say, so say to us or to our generations in time to come that we may say again, behold the pattern of the altar of the Lord, which our fathers made, not for burnt offerings, nor for sacrifices, but it is a witness between us and you. So it's like they got themselves out of it right there. There's going to be no war. They said, look, it's just a symbol. It's just a symbol for our children to see that we're connected between um, us and you. Because they, they're separated, right? They're separated on the east side of the border. All right? So they just wanted to stay connected, and that was their way of doing it. Turn to Judges chapter 6. So let's look at the fate of the eastern tribes. And all throughout, I'm just going to give you, a, a, you know, two or three examples of what the eastern tribes dealt with in the book of Judges. But all throughout the book of Judges, you see this type of thing happening to the east, eastern tribes. Okay, look at Judges chapter 6. And we're going to read um, basically the story of the call of Gideon. Now, Gideon was of, you know, the tribe of Manasseh. So he was on the east side of this settlement. And in Judges chapter 6, look down at verse number 6. We see the call of Gideon here. And the Bible says, And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. So here they were being overrun already. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And it came to pass, when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all that oppress you, and drave them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God, fear not the gods, lowercase g, of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell, but ye have not obeyed my voice. 
And there came an angel of the Lord that sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, and that pertained to Joash the Abizurite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. So they were being oppressed by the Midianites. They had no food. They were, you know, they were starving. So basically Gideon was, he was farming, and he was hiding, he was storing food. He was stashing food away. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then has all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers told of us, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. So he's asking, Why has this happened to us? And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, that thou shalt save Israel from the land of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said, Gideon said, O oh my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh. So here he is on the east side of the settlements, and I am the least in my father's house. So basically, Gideon is risen up. He is raised up. He is called from Manasseh. So the pushback against the Midianites starts in Manasseh. Look at verse 25 for sake of time. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, and even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it. So Gideon's from Manasseh, and there's an altar to Baal there. I mean, didn't Gideon just say, why has this all happened to us? God, have you forsaken us? Did God forsake them first? No, they forsook the Lord. They have altars of Baal. Look, they are oppressed by the Midianites, but they have... They have literally adopted the gods of these heathen people to the east side of them. All right? So Gideon is right, I mean, and God is not unmerciful, so he raises up judges. That's the point of the book of Judges, is to show that God has mercy again and again and again with his people. So this is the point of him raising up Gideon, who's on the east side, he's in this tribe of Manasseh, but there's an altar of Baal there. So they've, they've adopted these wicked gods, all right? I mean, he cuts down the grove, you know, we see then, then the judgment starts, right? Look down at verse number 33. But they're clearly being influenced by these eastern nations. Verse 33, then all the Midianites, so after they cut the grove down, what happens? After Gideon cuts the grove down, then all the Midianites and the Amicalites and the children of the east were gathered together and went over and pitched in the valley of Jezreel. Skip down to verse 35. And he sent messengers through all Manasseh, who also was gathered after him, and he sent messengers unto Asher, unto Zebulun, and unto Naphtali, that they came up to meet him. So look, they reunite. Look, they start the war in Manasseh, in that eastern country, and then they call the other tribes for help. But it all begins there. Okay. Now this whole thing concludes in chapter 7 in verse 24 where the Bible says, you know, and Gideon sent messengers through all, all Mount Ephraim saying, come down against the Midianites and take before them the waters unto Bethbara and Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters unto Bethbara and Jordan. Look, they, they pushed them back across. All these tribes... Had pushed, they pushed them back across that natural protective barrier, which was the Jordan River. Okay? Look at Judges chapter 10. Look, the, phys look, the physical waters that God put there was, I mean, it was for a reason. I mean, the physical Jordan River itself was there for a reason. And they pushed them back when, when uh, Gideon rose up to judge the people, they pushed them back across those waters. Right? But when they were back across those waters, were those two and a half tribes safe at that point? No, they had to push them further from there. Okay? So it wasn't just getting them across the Jordan that they had to do. In order for the two and a half tribes on the east side to be safe, they had to push them further than that. Okay? Keep that in mind. Turn to Judges chapter 10. We'll look at another example. Judges chapter 10, look at verse number 6. 
In Judges chapter 10 and verse 6, the Bible says, And the children of Israel did evil again in the sight of the Lord, and served Balaam and Ashtaroth and the gods of Syria and the gods of Zidon and the gods of Moab and the gods of the children of Ammon. So Moab and Ammon are east. So if you're looking at a map, you've got the Jordan River, you've got the west side tribes here, you've got the two and a half tribes here, and then Moab and Ammon are, are east of the eastern tribes. Okay? Now, the God, so they started serving all these gods again, and the anger of the Lord was hot against Israel and sold them into the hands of the Philistines and into the hands of the children of Ammon. And that year they vexed and oppressed the children of Israel 18 years. And the children of Israel that were on the other side of the Jordan in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead. Gilead is Gad. So here we see that they're taken over again, but it was the east tribes that got hit first. Look at verse number 9. Moreover, the children of Ammon passed over the Jordan to fight also against Judah and against Benjamin, against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was sore distressed. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord, saying, We have sinned against thee, both because we have forsaken our God and also served Balaam. So once again, we see that the trouble started in the east, but you see that it eventually caused trouble for the entire nation. Because it started in Gad, but then they pushed across the Jordan to the west, you see? And Baal spread, you know, the, the, the worship of Baal also spread. So the physical danger started on the east, the false god danger started on the east, and it all pushed across the Jordan eventually, all right? So look, there's many more stories like this in the book of Judges that we could look at. But look, here's what I'm trying to get at. This is all just a point of introduction, all right? This is why they had trouble. This is why these two and a half tribes had trouble. Because they were separated. They were physically separated from the other tribes of Israel. And they were doctrinally separated as they accepted, as they, they were influenced by the tribes on the east side of them. So they had, they had the good, godly people on this side and they had the wicked people on this side, and they were the ones that were influenced first. So there was a physical separation there, but a doctrinal separation as well. So look, they were the ones that were threatened and invaded first. Period. Both doctrinally and then physically. Because the doctrinal, the doctrinal stuff always came first. Because look, God's not going to throw the first punch. He never does. We always turn against Him, and then the judgment comes, the chastisement comes. So all that is point of introduction. The title of the sermon this morning is In the Midst. In the Midst. Is that there is protection in being part of the main settlement. Period. All right? There's protection in being part of the main settlement. So, what kind of protection are we talking about here? First of all, the eastern tribes were constantly the first to be attacked. All right? We could go and just study judges for another two hours and see that that's going on. They were on the other side of the Jordan River. I mean, think about it. They were on the border. They were on the border. Uh, my wife brought up, when I was, we were talking about this sermon, my wife brought up this story of, I don't know if you all remember, back in 2009, these Iranian, um, these hikers, they were hiking along, they were on the Iraq side. They were like three... Um, kids from Berkeley, three Americans, and they were, they were hiking along the Iraq-Iran border. I mean, what a great place to hike, right? And what happens is, these guys, or these two guys and this gal, they get beckoned. They see a soldier beckoning them, right? But they're, they're walking along the Iranian-Iraqi border, and they think they're on the Iraqi side. They're pretty sure they're on the Iraqi side. And they get beckoned by this soldier. And they don't really know where the border is, apparently, but this is an Iranian soldier. He beckons them over to them. And then, you know, the story goes that they cross over into Iran at that point, and to, you know, you see this armed guy beckoning you. They went over to him. They didn't know who he was. They get captured, charged with espionage or whatever Iran charges them with, and they spent like two years in prison before the United States was actually get, able to get them back. Right? But I mean, I remember even thinking at the time that this was going on, what were they doing hiking along the Iranian border? Right? I mean, look, you probably shouldn't just be walking right down that physical line so close where you don't know, you know, maybe I'm in this country, maybe I'm in that. Look, maybe they should have been in the midst of the camp. Maybe they should have been closer to home, closer to safety. 
Right? Because look, when the lion hunts his prey, he never goes to the center of the pack and, and goes after the alpha male. That's not how it works. Everybody knows, you've all seen, you know, the, the nature programs or whatever, they're looking for the weak one that falls behind, that stays at the water hole when they don't know, you know, they're like, oh, you know, everybody's left and they didn't realize it. Well, that's who the lion gets every time, right? So, I mean, look, it's the one that's fallen behind. It's the small one, right? So, the one that's not in the mix. So, look, you say, well, lion, you know, well, the analogy is interesting, and it's actually in the Bible. Look at your bulletin, right? 1 Peter 5, 1 Peter 5, 8 says, be sober, be vigilant, because, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. So, let's look at the river itself, okay? Think about the river. I mean, so why did God, you know, choose to put these people on the west side, the children of Israel on the west side, of the Jordan because there's protection in the actual physical river itself. That's why. Even Sun Tzu, I don't know if you've ever heard of the art of war, he talks about river warfare. I mean, he talks specifically about, you know, prosecuting war using a river. I mean, it's, there's several points in the book about specifically rivers. One of them is this. When an invading force crosses a river, on its onward march, do not advance to meet it midstream. It will be best to let half the army get across and then deliver your attack. So it's saying, when you're on that, say we're on the west side of the Jordan, and there's an army coming to invade us, he's literally telling us here how to attack that army. What you're supposed to do is let the army get halfway out of the river onto your land and then attack the army when half of them is still in the river and half is out of the river. That way you push the other half into the river and now you've got all of them stuck in the river, basically. But now, that doesn't apply at all when you think about being on the east side of the Jordan. You are literally at this point, you are between the river, you're the one that's going to be pushed into the river as you get invaded from the east side. So it was strategically a horrible, horrible position for them to be in. And it basically, it shows you why God's plan was perfect for the children of Israel for their physical protection. Going on the east side of the river actually worked against them. But guess what? Turn to Acts chapter 2. God has given us a Jordan River today. A physical Jordan River. And I'll show you that now. Turn to Acts chapter 2 and just look at verse number 1. So we see, you know, God has a, God, God's just not going to leave us with all of our enemies surrounding us with no protection, Amen. right? So God has provided that for us today. He provided that physically for the children of Israel with the Jordan River. Look at Acts chapter 2 and verse number 1. And the Bible says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. You know, look, some weren't logged in from other states. They were all together in one place. This is your local church right here. Look at verse number 41. So, of course, they're all together in one place, and this great miracle happens. This speaking in tongues happens. Speaking in other languages happens. They get all these people saved. It's this great, wonderful thing that happens. Look at verse number 41. And the Bible says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. That's a pretty good day of soul winning right there. And they, continually st they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, and fellowship, and breaking of bread, and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things in common, sold their possessions and goods, and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple, and breaking of bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. So here we see that being physically together led these people to be of the same heart, of the same mind, of the same doctrine. They were all in one Accord. They were all together in one accord. But they were physically together. They were physically, literally, in one place. I mean, this is super important for the believer today to understand this. That you need to be physically together with other believers. 
period. It's not, you know, we live in a day where you can be, you know, connected to so many different people, but the Bible teaches that you are to be physically together. And then you will be in singleness of heart, right? Look, Paul, look at Paul's letters throughout the Bible. Look at Paul's letters. He's, he's constantly, he's visiting a place while he's writing letters to another place, right? Remember Wednesday night we talked about the Galatians, right? I mean, he, he visited them, and then he left for a while, and then he had to write letters to them because he's like, hey, you know, if I'm not there, you know, things went awry, right? So, I mean, we need to be physically together in one place. I mean, there's strength in the gathering of believers, period, and protection. It's your Jordan River. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 31. You think this is a new concept? You think that, oh, we're in the church age now? You think this is a new concept? It's not a new concept. It's the same concept. Look at Deuteronomy 31. Look at verse number 12. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 31.12, we see the same concept of this protection in the gathering of believers in the Old Testament. Gather the people together, men and women and children, and thy stranger that is within thy gates, that they may hear and that they may learn and fear the Lord your God and, to, and observe to do all the words of His law. So what, what is the result of us all being together? Even the children, by the way. It doesn't say, um, except the children go to Sunday school. All the, t all the people are together. And it says men, women, and children. And it says the result of that is that you will fear the Lord your God. What was the problem with all of these different things that happened in Judges when they got overtaken, whether it was from the east or wherever, is they stopped fearing the Lord. They first stopped fearing the Lord, then they started bringing in the false gods. So, look, they're saying you have to gather together. Gather the people together. That is the command. Look at verse 13. And that their children, which have not known anything, may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God. So the children are supposed to be part of the gathering too. So they will what? They'll learn to fear the Lord your God. That's what's happening in a family integrated church. When the children are hearing the Bible preach, they're learning to fear the Lord. Period. And as long as ye live, look, and, and this is interesting, as long as ye live in the land, whither ye go over Jordan to possess it. So basically... It even makes a little shot at, you know, you're supposed to live over the Jordan here. You're not supposed to be, you know, it makes a reference to the Jordan here of that protection. That's why the Lord chose the west side for that protection. He has the local church for you for a reason, for your protection. If you never come to it or you don't visit it very much, it's not going to protect you. You know, if you live on the other side of the Jordan River, the Jordan River is of no value to you. It's the same thing. So the local church is your Jordan River. Turn to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse number 25. Let me make another real quick application just for the ladies. Just for the ladies. So listen up, ladies. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. So we see that the Jordan River, that the local church is our protection that God has given us. Look at Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 25. It says, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Ladies, did you know that your husband is your Jordan River? Your husband is there for your protection. He is there to love you and protect you as Christ Gave, I mean, he's there to give himself for you if necessary. So, are you, you know, are you on board? Are you living on the other side of the Jordan with your husband? Or are you this, you know, are you rebelling against your husband? Because if you're rebelling against the person that God has given you to protect you, you're living on the east side of the Jordan. You, the, the, the protection will be of none effect. So don't, so live on the west side. Live, live in that protection that the Lord has provided you. Look, the Bible says that the, the, the woman is the weaker vessel. That's why He gave you your husband. To give you that protection. To give you that, you know, that comfort in your life. As Christ loved the church. I, Christ loved the church with everything that He had. And, and that's what you have in your husband. Use it. Live on the west side. Use that protection. It's there for you. God provided it for you. The second point is this. Turn to Joshua chapter 22. 
So we see that God, give, God gives us protection. God gave us protection. Our church is our Jordan River. Ladies, your husband is your Jordan River. Look at Joshua, verse 22. Jo Joshua, chapter 22. I want to show you with my second point here the importance of sticking with God's plan. The importance of sticking with God's plan. Look at Joshua 22. In verse number 1, the Bible says, Then Joshua called the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh, and said unto them, Ye have kept all... So this is after they fought. This is after they did what they were supposed to do. Ye have kept all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, and have obeyed my voice and all that I commanded you. And ye have not left your brethren these many days unto this day, but have kept the charge of the commandment of the Lord your God. And now the Lord your God hath given rest unto your brethren, as he promised them, now, therefore now return ye, and get unto your tents, and unto the land of your possession, with Moses, which Moses, the servant of the Lord, gave you on the other side of Jordan. He releases them. He said, hey, because look, Moses didn't go, right? Joshua went and fought the battles. Joshua commanded these men that said they would come across and fight. They fought on the west side. They did a good job. They fulfilled what they promised to do. Joshua releases them. He said, you did it. Go home. Go to your land. Go back to your families. Look at verse number 10. And this is what we just, we, we saw this earlier. And they came under the borders of Jordan that are in the land of Canaan. And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh built there an altar by the Jordan, a great altar to see to. And the children of Israel said, Behold, the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh have built an altar over against the land of Canaan, in the borders of Jordan, in the passage of the children of Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, the whole congregation of the children of Israel gathered themselves together at Shiloh to go up to war against them. For the Lord hath made... Skip down to verse 25. So they go to war because they, get, they gather at Shiloh. You know why they gather at Shiloh? Because in Joshua 18, that's where the actual altar is. That's where the tabernacle is. That's where the real altar is. So they're jealous for their God. This is actually a good thing that they're doing here. They're upset. They think, hey, they're going to make their own nation. They're going to make their own God. We're going to take care of this problem right now. And then, of course, in verse 25, they explain it away and they say, For the Lord hath made Jordan a border between us and you. Ye children of Reuben, the children of Gad, ye have no part in the Lord, so your children to make our children cease from fearing the Lord. Therefore, we said, now let us prepare to build an altar, not for burnt offering, nor for sacrifice. So they came to war, and they're like, hey, it's not, it's not, we're not trying to, re, we're not trying to sacrifice over here. That's still at Shiloh. That's still there. It's just for a witness, that it may be a witness between us and you and our generations after us. So look, it was just a witness, a monument of sorts, Right? But, but think of this new altar. Think of this thing that they built. Because of their separation, they built this. Right? Because of their separation. And just everyone freaked out. They thought they were building another altar. And even though it wasn't necessarily unto a false god, it was not an altar that the Lord commanded to be built. It, it was not God's plan that they live on the east side. It was not God's plan A that you know, they build this altar basically. So they went out and, you know, their intentions were, it's not that their intentions were bad, right? It was still pretty brazen to set up this witness altar. They kind of just made it up. They kind of just thought it would be a good idea themselves, they, you know, but it wasn't God's plan. Same thing with the land that they settled, all right? They were not amongst the people. They felt separated immediately, so they go and they build this fake altar, basically. <laughs> Right? That almost gets them, you know, killed. So look, when you're, the point is this. When you're not amongst the congregation, you'll be easier to remove from the doctrines that you've been taught. And it will be easier to separate you. Hebrews 10.25, you don't have to turn there. I'll just read it for you. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together, as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another. If you're with the congregation, if you're with what God has provided for you physically, in person, it will be harder for you to drift off into weird fake altars, basically. Amen. Someone's going to say, hey, hey, uh, don't go build some weird altar. That's not in the Bible. Right? Someone will tell you that if you're amongst the people. But if you're all by yourself, turn to Malachi chapter 3. If you're all by yourself, all bets are off. Malachi chapter 3. Being in the midst of the people also strengthens your faith. Look at Malachi chapter 3. Look at Malachi chapter 3. 
And look at verse number 16. The Bible says in Malachi 3.16, Then they that feared the Lord spake often to one another. And the Lord hearkened and heard it, and the book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord and for them that thought upon his name. So here we see that in, in, in Malachi 3 that they're strengthened because they speak often to one another. They're fellowshipping together. They're together speaking to each other. Being amongst the congregation strengthens you through difficult times, even. I mean, think about soul winning. I mean, how many times have you heard people that don't come to church, that aren't in a good church, say, oh, well, we're just going to start our own soul winning thing where we're at or whatever, right? Look, it's just never going to work well because you don't have that congregation strengthening you. Look, I mean, there's difficult times out soul winning. I mean, I remember when we first got to Sacramento, I, I specifically remember this time. We pulled up, it was like the first time we had gone soul winning in Sacramento in a really nice neighborhoods. You say, what worries you? What kind of neighborhoods worry you when you're out soul winning? The kind of neighborhoods that worry me are where there's like $500,000 homes and up. Those scare me. You pull up to those neighborhoods, and I just remember sitting in my car being like, oh man, this is going to be rough when you pull up to these nice neighborhoods. Because these people aren't going to be receptive is the first thing that comes into your head. But then guess what? Your soul winning partner and his family pulls up next to you and you're like, oh well, at least I'll get to talk to Brother Vladi or Brother David or whatever. We'll get, you know, in, in neighborhoods like that, you just start to learn that look, it's just, it's just better fellowship time. Because no one else wants to talk to you, so you get to talk to each other. Brother Joe Jones one time went to a neighbor, Brother uh, Pastor Joe Jones and I went through a neighborhood and like, I can't even remember knocking a door. It was a neighborhood like that. We just talked the whole time. We we're just like, knock, knock, knock. Everyone's like, get out of here. We're like, okay. And we're just talking the whole conversation the whole time. I was like, it felt more like fellowship than soul winning, I told him when we were done. And he's like, hey, whatever, either way. Right? But look, that is where the, the congregation strengthens you in, in times like that. You know, I mean, sometimes, look, sometimes God's service is rough. Sometimes God's service is tough. Like, I mean, we kind of had a tough week, you know, with some of the things that happened around the church here. Yesterday, I'm with Garrett and Jacob, and we're building something outside the church to keep some of these, these bums out of here. And we're, we're coming to the church, we're going to Home Depot, we're coming to the church, and we're almost done, and we forget a drill bit. And we're like, ah, oh, we got to go all the way back to the house. To, and, Gar you know, Garrett's like, I'm going to out Garrett. He's like, ah, oh, we got to go all the way back to the house to get a drill bit. I'm like, hey, I was like, going back to the house and getting a drill bit is God's service. That's, that's serving God. You know, we're driving back to the house. It's just, it's just God's service. And you know what? Thank God that I had these two guys with me yesterday because it, it, it built me up. It strengthened me. So, I mean, together, you know, the Bible says being together, talking together, being congregated will strengthen your faith. It's your protection. It's your Jordan River. Just keep, look, just keep serving together. You're going to get beat down by yourself. If I was by myself this week, I'd have been, like, depressed. Okay? Seriously. You say, oh, but, you know, you're the satellite leader. I would have been depressed if I was by myself this week. But I'm not by myself. I got you guys. I got, you know, Sunday always to look forward to. Wednesday, soul winning. I mean, look, this is what keeps us going in this life, no matter what. It's like bring it on, anything, as long as we're together as long as we have our Jordan River that God has provided us, right? Conclusion, look, the tribes, think of these tribes, these two and a half tribes, Gad, Reuben, the half tribe of Manasseh, they didn't have, they weren't, they didn't have bad intentions. Just, just remember this for a second, okay? They didn't have bad intentions when they settled on the east side, but they should have, they should have stayed with God's program. Their decision to separate themselves from the nations, it had consequences for generations, if you read the Bible. Whenever you separate yourself from God's plan, the same will be true for you. Think about that for a minute. When you separate yourself from God's plan, it will have generational consequences for you. You say, that sounds scary. It should. Let's learn from the Bible. Look, now, here's something else. Are you, are you recognizing a little bit of theme here when it comes to like intentions? When you, you, there's a lot of good intentions in the Bible. There's a lot of people who are like, hey, I'm going to try this and this is going to happen. 
Have you started to notice when you read the Bible, when you listen to Bible preaching, have you started to notice this theme in the Bible that intentions don't really matter much? Have you started to notice that? You should. As you read the Bible more, you should understand that, look, your intentions don't mean much. What matters is your methods. That's what matters. What matters is results. What matters is your actions. That's what matters. Look, the whole Bible. Look, the Bible is, is, is God. God has given you methods. I mean, think about this. God has given you methods, and then He shows you proven results that come from those methods. Amen. Intentions? What? Where are intentions at? If you go out and you have good intentions and you end up hurting a bunch of people, what does it matter what your intentions were? You still hurt those people. Oh, but I didn't mean like that. It doesn't matter. When you veer from God's methods, you will not get the same results. So you sit here and you read the Bible, right? You read the Bible and you see that God gives you these methods and He says, if you do it this way, Here's an ex it will, this will happen. And not only will this happen, here's a bunch of examples of how it did happen. And here's a bunch of examples of how it didn't happen for people. I mean, he gives you examples on both sides. But if you veer from that plan, all bets are off. For you, for your family, for the church, for everything. If we veer from God's plan, we're, we're just kind of like, entering into a random number, number generator or something. I don't want to do that. I know, look, I know the results I want in my life. I think you probably do too. If you know anything about the Bible, I mean, most people, most Christians, know the results they want to have in your life. So follow God's methods because your intentions mean nothing if, you're, if your methods don't match the Bible. It's that simple. You don't know more than God. You haven't figured something. Look, that pasture, that pasture looked great to them. That path, look, look at all this green grass. I'm sure they were doing their numbers. I've done this. Hey, if I rent another 100 acres next year, I can increase my flock this much. They're sitting there doing the numbers, and they're like, well, our business is going to thrive, and all this, and look at this land. Look at all the water holes in this pasture. This is great. Moses, give us this land. But they didn't see the invasions. They didn't pencil that in. They didn't see the influence of these nations on their children, on their wives. Pretty soon, hey, they're increasing that flock. They're increasing that flock. They're, they're moving their business forward, and their children are literally worshiping the devil. Intentions mean nothing. It's the methods that matter. I mean, that's the Bible. That's the Bible. It doesn't matter how it pencils out in your stupid little logical mind. You stick to the methods that God has, has given you in the Bible. You stick to His way. You stick to His Jordan River in your life, which is the church, the local church, not YouTube. The people gathered together talking together. You stick to your family. You take, you take solace in your husband and protection in your husband and you get on board with your husband and you get on his program and you help him with his program and then you will have that protection. Amen. Stick to God's plan because your intentions mean nothing. But the methods mean everything. And God, look, God promises you those results. Amen. It's that simple. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for um, just these huge lessons in the Bible, God. I mean, I, I thank you for um, the, these, just the infinite lessons that we can learn from the Bible, from the nations, from the people, from the, you know, the world that we're, that we're reading about in the Bible. We thank you for the methods that you've laid forward. Just please help us to understand that, that we need to stick to what you're saying. And, and it, it doesn't matter... You know, that we just, we want things to go a certain way. We have to stick to the way that you said it. We thank you for all this wisdom, Lord. I ask that you bless soul winning this afternoon. Bless this church. Bless all the people in it. And bless uh, church this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.